Welcome to the Hollywood Outsider, an award-winning weekly entertainment podcast that's available at thehollywoodoutsider.com, as well as your favorite podcast app, whatever it is you you use, we're there. My name is Aaron Peterson, and I'll be your host for the special episode of The Hollywood Outsider. Every once in a while, we like to bring you interviews with independent filmmakers to give you insight into what goes into getting their projects made, as well as insight into the film itself. And this time, we're talking about HBO Max's The Perfect Weapon, and it revolves around cyber terrorism, where we are with cyber attacks. Now, the film is roughly 90 minutes of absolute terror, because <laughs> I was scared. The entire movie, by the end of the movie, I think I almost deleted my Facebook account. I almost made my parents delete theirs, and I almost made sure my kids never even look on the internet again. There's a lot of information here that is, well, terrifying, but it's also important. It's very important because we need to know where we are in terms of the world and what terrorism looks like these days. What's funny is the film goes back to what is perceived to be the beginning of cyber attacks, which is when George W. Bush's Olympic Games targeted Iranian nuclear facilities. Now, the film builds into the Sony hacks, targeting a Las Vegas casino. The, the Sony hacks, everybody listening to this podcast knows all about that. Seth Rogen and James Franco, where they made the interview where they basically tried to take out a certain North Korean dictator. And that film caused some ripples. And the film goes into the details of what happened to the hack, how that information got out there. And also, we continue along the path, and this has interviews with Seth Rogen and many other personalities including Director of National Intelligence, James Clapper. And it evolves into, yes, Russia's meddling in the 2016 election, as well as what that means going forward. What else could happen with cyber terrorism, including China's now very, very vastly involved plan to purchase a whole lot of 5G infrastructure. There are a lot of details in this documentary that everyone that lives in the world that we know should check out. And perception hack is definitely a phrase that we need to be familiar with because that is talked about in detail in the documentary. John Maggio, the director of The Perfect Weapon, talks about it in our interview. Essentially what that means is how they are using our own perceptions, our own feelings, our own passion against us as a weapon. It happens. It's happening and it's fascinating and terrifying all in the same box. Okay, so I'm going to get right into this interview because I, I think it's a very important one. It's definitely a very timely one. We're releasing this episode on Election Day. Not sure when you're listening to it, but that's when we release it, on Election Day. It fits. I'm talking to director John Maggio about his film, The Perfect Weapon, how he adapted that material from David Sanger's equally riveting book. And I hope you guys really, really do check this out. Again, it's on HBO Max. Read the book, watch the movie, or do both. Do both if you like, because they're both definitely worth it. This is one of those. I can't implore you enough to watch. Take a listen to my interview with director of The Perfect Weapon, John Maggio. Hi, is this John Maggio? It is. Is this Aaron? Yes, John. How are you? Good, man. How are you doing? doing I am doing great. I'm a little terrified now that I've watched uh, your movie, but I'm otherwise good. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's saying that. You know, it's so funny. It's like the timing, I think, of the release was get, you know, was what HBO wanted to get it out before the election. Yeah. But you know, I didn't realize that what I was making at the level of angst we would be under, uh, I mean, maybe naively, like, you know, it was like the last thing I think anybody wants to think about. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but what that's the world we live in. <laughs> you know, I kind of always open the interview with the same question I ask everybody, like, what made you want to get into filmmaking? Was there a specific moment for you? You know, that's a really good question. I had been a musician. When I got out of college, I ended up, I was working as a journalist in Washington, and then I wanted to get out of that business and kind of really focus on music. So I moved out to L.A. and got a record deal at Hollywood Records, Walt Disney's rock label, a few years after I moved out to L.A. And I was, I thought, okay, that's going to be my trajectory. But in the process, before I got the record deal, I was doing a lot of work on music videos, mm -hmm. like Puff Daddy music videos, Matchbox 20. It was in that era of sort of mid-90s. Uh, mid to late 90s. And I learned a lot about the craft of, of making movies. And I had been writing a lot of music video treatments for people. Um, and so at some point, I'd always thought maybe I would combine my journalism with filmmaking. But at that point, I was really focused on, on a career as a star. <laughs> and then I unceremoniously got dropped from my record label. And I left LA, moved back to New York. And it was then that I was like, you know, I think 
I, you know, I still have something I want to say. And it, I really, you know, I always loved documentaries and it just seemed like the logical sort of next step in my creative career. You know, I always wanted to combine the uh, sort of artistic part of myself with something with my journalism and have make a statement. So I started getting into it right around then, but that was right about right before nine 11, this was in 2000. So it was really a kind of combination of things. I'd always been a sort of artistic person, very creative. And then I just sort of, everything kind of came together at that moment. So you went from rock star to documentary director. Yes. Imagine my then girlfriend, now <laughs> wife, imagine how she felt. She was, thought she was dating a guy who was on a rocket ship to superstardom. And then I was like, yeah, I think I'm going to shift gears to a uh, documentary film. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it was, it was a little bit of a, little bit of a shift, but you know, it felt so natural because what I do is I feel so, so super indulged in many ways. Like, mm-hmm. you know, my, my, the journalism itch, the music, I worked very closely. I've worked with the same composer for my, almost my whole career, Gary Lionelli. And I'm very hands-on about the scores and how music and also just connecting with people emotionally. Like it, it just, I have to pinch myself sometimes because I really do feel like it. it is my career is so much about who I am, I think. And it was lucky I found it because, you know, I, I in some way was I, I didn't didn't think music was going to be the only thing I wanted to do and was wasn't, you know, scratching all of my itches. But filmmaking does kind of remarkable. Yeah, and we should mention you won an Emmy for your film Panic, the untold story of the financial crisis, which which I'm sure you'll be in the conversation again for this one. Why are you so passionate about U.S. politics? Right? I mean, the things that are happening to U.S. national security to affecting the. I mean, why is that where your focus on documentaries is? Do you think? You know, it, it's interesting you say that. I mean, obviously, I'm a very I'm a political person, and I think that that's just naturally. I always have been. I, I studied environmental science when I was in college. I wanted to be in. in you know, I moved to Washington for work almost immediately after. So politics has always been sort of also a strain in me. I I love the drama of politics. I love being inside the bubble. I mean, that's what panic was really all about. And to a certain extent, to the extent that I could get inside the bubble with national security issues, I I, Mm -hmm. I find that sort of decision making fascinating. You know, the the people who have to who have to make, you know, last second decisions about whether we attack somebody or whether we, you know, you know, bail out a bank or, you know, and it may not be the most popular decisions, but the decisions that people make. So I think I'm always trying to connect to the sort of humanity behind politics and, and history, too. I mean, I love history. Most of my films are have a, a, obviously a very strong historical bent to them because I find that, you know, if you look at a film that I make uh, about Ben Bradley, the former um, editor of The Washington Post, mm-hmm. I mean, I felt like so strongly that that was we were that Trump was replaying almost note for note, you know, the the um, Nixon playbook. But whereas Nixon, you know, had to go through people like Bradley, there were curators of the news back then. You know, he didn't have Twitter. You know, Trump can reach right out to his silent majority. And I think when you look at that film, you see all of the, you see a, a roadmap for how we got where we are today. So so I'm also fascinated by that. I mean, it's, I'm, I think at the end of the day, I'm always asking myself, how do we get here? Um, and you, if you look close enough, you find clues. Well, for people that don't know, The Perfect Weapons, based off the book by New York Times uh, national security correspondent David Sanger, and the book is riveting, and, and all props to the book. But you, you, you've given the voice a face here, is what I would say, with a, with a very <laughs> intense narrative structure. I mean, it's one thing to read a book and be like, oh, that happened, that happened. It's another thing to see it in real time and, and see how the pieces connect, and you have these fascinating interviews, but from, for, and I'll talk about that in a second, but from a filmmaking perspective alone, how did you determine how to make the look of this? Well, you know, the first thing I thought about, and I remember telling David this, because David is just such an un- unbelievable reporter. Um, I told him that, you know, there are very few people that he talks to, his sources are not going to go on camera. So we mm-hmm. had to tackle that first. So my initial instinct, to be honest with you, was who are the victims? You know, if there really is a war going on, who are the victims? Not the people, not, you know, not, you know, we all in some way are victims. Many of us have gotten that letter from Equifax or our <laughs> bank that says, you know, there's been a breach. Yep. Yep. But of, of this, of the state sponsored, um, variety, I wanted to understand who they were. And I thought we could attach to the story more emotionally that way. So one of the first people I thought of was Seth Rogen, actually. So that, that for me, the Sony hack 
and the and the the hack and dump of the emails, not even the you know seventy destroying seventy percent of Sony's uh, computer infrastructure. The the hack and the dump of the emails was I think when all of a sudden this was brought out into the spotlight. Right. Um, that that this was a real war going on, and I thought, well, who was at the center of that? And it was both Michael Linton at Sony. And Seth Rogen, and I, I got really lucky getting them. I mean, so when Seth agreed, and then Michael Litton wanted to come on and make sure he got his part of the story out. And, and, I, and then I got, you know, I went down to Washington and I met with John Podesta. And I know he talked before, but I thought, well, let me see what I can get from him. And I, st- I was sort of, it was remarkable in the film, you feel it on him. He feels it's the albatross, you know, that he fell for a phishing scam that, you know, nearly toppled our democracy. He still wears it on his sleeve and you feel it. And so I thought that was a good way to connect with people emotionally as well. And then just the obstinance of the, of the decision makers of the Jim Clappers and the Alexanders to, to talk about these, these issues from within inside the bubble, I thought was unique too. So really, you know, the way I approached it was through people. I told David, you know, when we began this, it wasn't going to be a film about ones and zeros and, and shady, and shady hackers and, and hoodies, but I wanted, to sort of, you know, throw the spotlight on the people, who, you know, the casualties. And, you know, even if you look at someone like Dimitri, uh, Dimitri Shimkiv in um, Ukraine, I mean, Ukraine is, is, as we say in the film, is Putin's Petri dish. You know, and, they're, and you know, the, the, the Russians are so deeply into Ukraine society, but also their power grid. I mean, they turn it off regularly. You know, they attack the subway system, the, the airport. I mean, they're under constant cyber attack. Uh, and the people there, you know, like a lot of people in Eastern Europe kind of shrug and bear it and sort of deal with it. But, um, you know, everything we see going on in that country, we, you know, we'll see it eventually here. And to see it through D- Dimitri's eyes, I thought was really powerful. Well, and I was alluding to a, a little bit ago, it's it's very much like a Tony Scott thriller, the way that you, the way that you chose to shot, shoot it. So the, the, oh, thank you. The, only, the entire time I'm watching it, I'm just waiting for Gene Hackman to pop out of retirement or something. <laughs> Well, that clearly was on my mind. I mean, it was, it was, you know, part of it too was, was wanting to use the satellite photos and the drone photography. And, you know, those, I, I think they're, they're often overused in documentary films, but when they're used with purpose, I think they can be, you know, they can be powerful. And I think in this case, to see the kind of global reach of these mm-hmm. things, it's that, that a group of hackers in Tehran or North Korea via Malaysia, you know, North Korea, who, who at the time had 28 websites, can reach across the world and destroy one of the most powerful brands in the world, Sony, in one fell swoop. I mean, that is, I mean, that's on its face. It's just inherently dramatic when you really drill into it, you know, and think about it. So that's kind of what was on my mind. I wanted to to to, to move briskly, not unlike Panic. I mean, Panic was also a good roadmap for me where it was like, if I just piece together chronologically, people can sort of start to see the puzzle. Uh, come into play, you feel that sense of urgency. And that's that's what I was gunning for with this film. The film begins at what many consider the beginning of cyber terrorism with George W. Bush's strike against Uranian's uh, nuclear capabilities in the Olympic Games program, which continued under Obama. So as you're putting this film together, were you aware of how deep this rabbit hole went? Um, you know, yes. I mean, just, I mean mostly from, from, obviously, from David's reporting. Mm-hmm. You know, he was the one who really cracked the code. I mean, the, the, the Stuxnet is code, as it was named, once it sort of escaped the box, as we say in the film, David was the one who kind of, out of the ether, started to pull all of those threads and pull it together. So I did have a really good sense of it. You know, the, the problem is, and, I, and I've talked about this, is, you know, while it looks, it would appear that we started the war, we drew first blood with Stuxnet. I mean, there's so many covert operations that are going on that we just never heard about. So Stuxnet was, was the shot across the bow that, ever, that the world heard. And we campaigned for that ever since. You know, I think, I think you know, we make a, a very strong example of that in the film that after Stuxnet, um, when the Iranians, you know, heard Shelton Adelson threaten to drop a nuclear weapon on them, they had a, they had a weapon that was cheap, was asymmetrical and easy to, um, to utilize. Now, you take off from the Olympic Games program to more commercial uses of attacks with Sheldon Adelson's Las Vegas casino and the Sony hack, which led to a lot of chaos for both companies. And for those that don't know, North Korea went after the film The Interview, which was a Sony film, and essentially went after the stars, Seth Rogen and James Franco, as well as people that worked behind the scenes on the film. 
these were the very public ones. And Sony's was so public because it involved two huge movie stars who were essentially being threatened. Shouldn't we as a country and a people have taken this threat a bit more seriously, like right then and there? Yeah, but you know what? The, that's the problem. Is, and I try to, in the film, kind of not so subtly, but, you know, I, I, I try to implicate the media as, as, as the reason that cyber is such a perfect weapon, especially in this country. Right. Because we, we are uniquely vulnerable to these kinds of disinformation attacks and hack and, dump, hack and dump attacks because we have a public square. We have a First Amendment. We believe in that stuff the way other countries don't and have a closed Internet system and it's very controlled. So we're we, it's a huge target for cyber for that kind that kind of hack and dump cyber attack. And the problem is that the media in this country just played into it. You know, they were dumpster dived. They were going and finding emails they thought were juicy and publishing it, never considering or at least discussing in twenty fourteen and then even in twenty sixteen that this was stolen information. And I think it's only taken sadly taken to this election. Now we're seeing kind of all the missteps by Twitter and Facebook and other social media platforms to, to control this stuff, but they don't quite know how to do it yet. And without looking like they're putting their fingers on the scales of the election in someone else's favor. So it is a real problem that doesn't have a real clear answer. I think, I think that as a, as a world, we need to sort of discuss, you know, there are Geneva conventions around conventional warfare and, you know, other things that, that maybe we need to, to ha start having those larger discussions about the use of these weapons um, right. before it's too late before you know before these are often short of war and it costs companies you know billions billions of dollars now these some of these attacks and you know is that going to change when with 5g we have driverless cars and you know those can be commandeered by foreign actors and you know is that we're going to start seeing real death so i think we need to have that conversation and the other thing too is that a lot of these countries go right up to the line you know, like you see in the Sony attack. I mean, Obama didn't really know how to respond because we have still the world's most powerful military. But is that the right? You know, do we drop Tomahawk missiles on North Korea because they took down Sony? And yeah. we, I don't. We really haven't had a deep enough conversation or understanding of it yet. Hopefully, this film will spark some of that conversation. You know, you talk a little bit about especially how how it has evolved and now they're creating profiles, they're causing chaos, personality conflicts and causing a lot of infighting with with ourselves. As you're as you're putting this together, at what point do you, John Maggio, <laughs> become the most terrified? Uh, it's a, you know, it was a lot around 5G because 5G is like not something one can make a film about because it's very sort of. Mm -hmm. Not real. It's not. It's not, not real yet. You know, the Chinese are laying cable all over the world. Before COVID, our plan was to actually be embedded with uh, Huawei and and be in some places around the world where they are actually laying cable. But they're laying cable around the world, and and the West doesn't have a very good alternative. We, I think, we were caught a little on our heels with 5G and how revolutionary it's going to be. And you know, frankly, the Chinese stole a lot of our technology, but and, and it was and it was a space in hardware that America sort of had grown away from. Western uh, European countries have some, you know, like Nokia is a little bit in the mix, but China can do it so cheaply. So if China is controlling our networks, you know, is America ready to live in a world with a dirty network, you know, where no longer, you know, for years we have obviously been listening to everybody because everything is controlled on American network. Right. How are we going to be controlled by the Chinese? And I think that is kind of a frightening scenario as, you know, as, as, as I, I mean, the way I see it, China is into em, empire building. They want to build, they want to be the hegemons, whereas Russia is into kind of you know, empire destruction. They're trying to destroy our democracy. We're aware of that one. The one we're not completely aware of yet as a public is is China. And so that's that's the thing that keeps me up at night a little bit. And we're going to dive right into it totally willingly because we'll agree to any terms in an agreement. We will, um, any user agreement, we will agree to anything. And the, the faster the speed, the quicker we're going to agree. So 5G feels oh, like, a, like a, just a black hole of chaos for us. Yeah, no, it is. And, and the idea of driverless cars, I mean, the idea that your, your air conditioner and your refrigerator and your, and your clock radio are all operate on the same network while, you know, whoever's controlling that 5G network is going to be constantly sending updates. And what's coming along with those updates? They're extracting more information about you. I mean, look, China has already 
you know, through their uh, IP theft, through the theft of so much personal information from insurance companies, mm-hmm. from um, OPM, which is one of the largest hacks in history, they are able now to draw a very, very, very succinct picture of a large number of Americans, which, you know, we may or may not be comfortable with because we, as a country, live very, like, open. Right. We, we share photos of our children, intimate ideas that we have about life, our opinions. Everything feels like it's very public, but not who your mistress is, you know, not where you spent the night last. Like that's the kind of information that right. uh, I don't think we're ready to deal with, you know, and then think about it, too, when you're maybe in your driverless car or air traffic control. Like, do we really want to see the control of those networks? And. You know, to their credit, the Trump administration is pushing back very hard. You got Mike Pompeo out there. I just wonder about their approach um, and if that's really going to make any difference. Once the, the European Union goes with Huawei or another Chinese competitor, I don't know. It's a slippery slope, and it's it's one that deserves a lot of attention. You know, you me- you mentioned the election interference, and Russia did interfere with the election, but that's a trigger for a lot of people. You say it, and they automatically don't even want to listen to what you have to say after that. And I think your documentary yeah. does a very good job of explaining what that really means. And honestly, I, I feel like it's it's a very fair representation because your, your film and the book really isn't saying Trump was necessarily complicit. It's just he was more agreeable and just kind yeah. of rolled with the punches, so to speak. But watching this, there are so many factors to what that actually means with Russia interfering with the election. So now we're on the eve of the next election or the election when people observe the interview, they might, the election is probably over. Right. What do you see as the number one issue Russia caused for the U.S. in the 2016 election that might be part of this next one or that you foresee as a potential problem for future elections? Like the number one problem you found from doing this film? Well, it's, it's absolutely, it's, it's the hacking of our mind. It's a, it's a perception hack. They don't have to do anything now. Mm-hmm. You know, you, we saw it in the Iowa caucus. You remember when the, the, the app failed uh, in the Iowa caucus and we, could, we didn't get the results of that for, for a week almost. Right. Um, everybody immediately turned to, oh, it's got to be Russia. Russia's in the system. And to me, that's the most sinister thing. The fact that they really don't have to do anything anymore. It's just, it's, it's the idea that they might be screwing around. So we may not know exactly what they've done in 2020 until we do the postmortem. And we sort of do the forensics of like, you know, how really how involved were they? I mean, Facebook has gotten pretty good at, at detecting bots. But the question is, you know, we may not know the kind of, quote unquote, useful idiots that Russia is using, as they call it. You know, real American operatives who maybe aren't even aware that they're they're pushing Russian disinformation. So I think we'll see. But I honestly think it almost doesn't matter anymore because we're living in a wilderness of mirrors where we just don't know what's true or untrue. And that is always was going to be an issue with the Internet, with the great experiment of the Internet, was that facts, people will curate their own facts now. And so we have to learn to think critically, we have to educate not just kids anymore about thinking critically about information they get online, but adults. You know, we're, seeing, we're seeing grown men and women flinging disinformation and memes at each other, that the origin of which nobody even knows. So... It's a real conundrum, and I and I think you know it, it, maybe not a satisfying answer that we can point to, like oh they're they're actually manipulating the election results, which I think are near impossible, but they're they're in our heads already since 2016, and and I think that's the real problem. We can't. Everybody's got their own information now. I mean, research is is a whole yeah. new world. <laughs> it's a whole new world. Yeah. No, it's it's incredible. It really, you, know, you see it play out. It doesn't take much. I mean, you know, when we were making this film, we would often go you know, to the QAnon sites and just sort of see what people were passing around. And, you know, the just the level of credulity we had about, you know, uh, that people believe this stuff and the QAnon stuff alone is really bizarre. And, and I just, I honestly, I don't know what the answer is, you know, and I don't want to come out too strongly against social media because mm-hmm. it's a foregone conclusion. We're there. We live in that, in that world now. But is it really better? I mean, when we when we think about you know the promise of Facebook in the Arab Spring, you know the ability to sort of bring people together and 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 have a revolution, I think there's something about human nature and social media that just is not a good fit. And um, those are larger questions that we have as society have to sort of address. 
maybe after the election, but I don't know. One one thing that Russia didn't do is they didn't make people this passionate about whatever it is that they're passionate about. And yeah, it's, I don't know how you bring that yeah. anger down, how you bring that ire down. I, I just don't know how you do it now. You know, I, I wonder a lot about whether or not it, that's the part of the human condition is to be aggrieved mm -hmm. in some form. And so if you want that, you'll find it. And if it's easy to find, if someone's feeding it to you on your on your Instagram feed or your Facebook feed, you're going to eat it. And I think that's part that's the weird part of human nature that I can't quite figure out. Those who want to be aggrieved and, you know, and Donald Trump needs it. You know, he gives everybody something to be angry about. <laughs> you know, he's, you know, I was watching one of his speeches. The whole thing is about how the world's against him. Everyone's against him. And people somehow connect to that. And that's, you know, him with the combination of social media and, and Twitter. Like I said, Nixon didn't have it. Maybe Nixon was the same kind of person, but he had to go through the guardians of, of the fourth estate. That doesn't exist anymore under Trump. He can reach right out and touch people directly. So that silent majority is now very vocal, and they're now taking over the roadways here in New York and New Jersey with their their SUVs and their Trump flags. So, yeah, there's a lot to be concerned about, and and cyber and cyber is clearly a culprit in all of it. Well, and and it feels very much like based on your movie and everything you're talking about now that they also implore psychology. I mean, they're utilizing psychology and cyber cyber terrorism to bring us down from within, essentially, like a Trojan horse oh, yeah, of sorts. Totally. And the Russians have been using propaganda. I mean, they're masters of propaganda for millennia. I mean, you know, they, they mm -hmm. have always been. And, and they're, you know, the other thing we, I think we have to think about from a strategic point of view is the Russians are playing a very long game. And they've been playing this game for a very long time. So it seems like frantic on our end to sort of stem the tide of disinformation 2016. This is just part of a continuation of their efforts to to um, destroy democracy. And they're willing to sort of wait. I mean, they're, they're, Putin is just a one piece in a long tradition of, of this kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's a trick. It's like, it is like, it, you know, they're, they're incredible at it. They come to this country, they study the weak, and then they exploit them. And they are like playwrights in a way, you know? And they go online and uh, it, it's, it is remarkable. And, and that's why I think it's such a, you know, the, the title, when we were thinking about what to call the film, because the book is called Perfect Weapon, but I thought about it, and it really is like a, it's a perfect weapon because it, for this, against this country, because like I said, we have this open system, and we get ourselves all tied in knots around it, you know, and that's, I, yeah, I, I wish I had an easy answer, uh, and I think a lot of it is education, but you know, we gotta, we, we got to let the temperature get come down a little bit. <laughs> Well, good luck with. It. We'll see what happens, you know, <laughs> yeah. after after Tuesday. Yeah, exactly. Can, can exactly. I ask you one uh, one final question? What, if any, confidence should the American people have in information seen on social media, based on all of your research? I think they could have, you know, a lot of confidence, but they have to do the work. When they see an when they see an article, tr find the provenance. You know, dig into it. Where is that? Where does that? When you click on that article, where does it take you back to? You have to think critically. And, and you know, you just, it's up to you. And I tell my kids this all the time. Don't tell me it's something you read on the internet, you know, at, at the dinner table. Like, let's <laughs> unpack that. Where is it from? You know, and, and that's for me. It's not, sadly, it's not just kids. I mean, my parents who are in their 80s are online now and sadly trading in disinformation unknowingly. You know, I'll get a comment. Like, oh, did you know that so and so did? And it's like, yeah, that's not true. Like, let's dig into where you found that article. You know, oh, it's from something called Patriots from Truth. Well, that sounds dubious. Let's dig a little further. Where is it? it just takes work. There's so much information, but it takes critical thinking. I can't stress it enough. It's, it's every citizen has to sort of take it on themselves to sort of dig deep. But you know what? We're too lazy because we, because we're getting an, we're getting an opinion that we want. We want, we want that bad news. We want, the, you know, and we're going to forward it to prove our point, to mm -hmm. attach to something that we really care about. But, you know, that's, that's not the right way to do it. Man, we, we have definitely evolved into a society where it's more about being right than it is about actually being right. Exactly. No, it's totally true. I mean, I couldn't, that's a perfect way to put it. It just doesn't matter anymore. I don't know how we re-educate. I do think, look, I don't know what's going to happen with this election. I do think we need a change to bring the temperature down. And I'm hopeful that if that change does happen, 
maybe we can start thinking more clearly. I was just mentioning to my editor, I was like, you know, remember when we used to talk about international news? Yeah. You know, like the fact that there was a beheading in Paris the other day or uh, in Quebec City there was problems and uh, in Afghanistan now there was just, you know, like those those are, are parts of the world that we are connected to. And yet we can't, you know, we're arguing over the over – whether whether Trump is going to question the election, and um, which is incredibly important, but it just it takes up so much. He takes up so much oxygen that it's it's hard to hard to think clearly. One thing I've I always want to ask a documentary director is you're you're going out there and you're trying to put the truth out for people to understand and they can decipher and have their own opinion about whatever it is the information whatever the information is that you have shown them. How hard is it for you to remain? objective i guess in, in those situations like this is a very volatile topic for for many people yeah. how do you remain as objective as you can be while you're making the movie well i think you have to see you know you have to look and uh it's, it's actually not that hard because you know like look at what, how we talk about trump in the film yes we question whether he was complicit or not we took his own words his own actions post-election in hamburg what he was saying during the election and, and so forth but we give him credit you know, when he, when he sort of decentralizes the cyber command, you know, those, those were decisions about using a cyber weapon used to be up to the president, and the president alone. And now in, in making it decentral and working through the Department of Defense, I think, I think America did a better job in the 2018 election of letting the rest of the world know not to come into our system mm-hmm. and kind of doing this persistent offense, as they call it. And I think that was effective. So, you know, it's like, so what was the? Why did he make that decision? Was it out of laziness? He didn't want to have to make those. I, I don't know. But the point of fact is, I think we have a more robust defense now because of Trump's decision to give that authority to the DOD. So, you know, I just think you got to you got to look at the facts and try to peel away all that all that stuff. But um, yes, am I a political person? Do I have a strong beliefs about things? Yeah, but I have to check that stuff. And it's not that hard because you know you get called out. You know, you'll get called out if it's like a one-sided polemic. I don't make polemics. I think other some filmmakers do, and I think those are great, and I'd love to watch them. But I, I think it's uh, it's important to me at the end of the day to look at something that's balanced and honest. So that's where my compass is. Absolutely, and I know I got to let you go. But what's next for you, John? What what are you doing next? Can you talk about it or oh, no? I, gotta, I you know I can't unfortunately, but a couple films with HBO coming up, you know, in 2021, and I'd be happy to when when. When we can talk about them in public, I would love to come back and talk to you. Absolutely. I, I think HBO probably does the best documentaries uh, around these days. I know some of them they buy, but some of them they, they, they definitely finance, and they do the best documentaries, yeah. I think, in the business. You know what? There's a tradition there of a kind of bespoke quality to everything that they do. Mm-hmm. And even with HBO Max, I mean, I, I'm enjoying the fact that my work, now, it's not all about the premiere, but has a longer mm-hmm. tail, so I can continue having conversations like this, you know, long after broadcast, because people are streaming it at different times. And I think, uh, yeah, they do have a commitment to it, and, and a lot of great nonfiction stuff's coming out of HBO right now, so I'm proud to be there. Well, I got to tell you, I'm, I'm really hoping, because I mean, I know the book, a book is just not, for me personally, and I know a lot of people are like this, they're very mm-hmm. visually uh, ordained. And, yeah. you know, a, a book isn't as riveting sometimes as actually seeing it. And your movie made everything click uh, in a lot of uh, ways. That's great to hear. In a lot of ways. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate that. Well, best of luck. And I hope to hear from you on your next one. I'll let you go. Awesome. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. All right. Take care. Okay. Right. Bye bye. Scared yet? I know I am. I'm going to go delete everything. Every- I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm probably going to. Post on social media about how I'm going to delete everything. <laughs> That's honestly what I'm going to do. But honestly, it's a terrifying documentary. It should scare the crap out of all of us. And also, fantastic. I'm not kidding. It reminded me of a Tony Scott film. It's so well paced and electric and just like, dun, 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 dun. I'm just, it just energized with excitement. And I was tense the whole time. And I am just terrified of what's going to happen next because you know something's going to happen, but we don't know what. Well, thank you, John, for taking the time to talk to us. We really do appreciate it. Hope you guys check out The Perfect Weapon on HBO Max, as well as our regular podcast, which drops every single week. Thank you so much for listening. Rate and review us on your preferred app of choice, and we're always available at thehollywoodoutsider.com. Remember, guys, the next time you head to a theater or sit comfortably on your couch and watch The Perfect Weapon and then delete all your social media accounts. 
by popcorn. Seriously, did you delete everything yet? Because you probably should.